For many original hardware enthusiasts, HDMI mods are their deepest desire. If they could, they would have an HDMI mod in every single classic console that they own. Others simply don't get this at all, wondering why anyone would even bother with original hardware if they weren't playing on a CRT. Well, why not both? That's the idea behind the highly anticipated N64 Digital by Pixel FX, which adds RGB and HDMI output to the console, along with D-Blur and some very robust scaling. Even if you aren't the biggest N64 fan, this could be a tantalizing teaser for what the future may hold for other systems. And if you already have an RGB or HDMI mod for N64, is this new one worth swapping in, or should you just stick with what you've got? Let's find out. Pixel FX was founded in January of 2021, but its team is by no means new to the video game modding scene. They have collectively designed some of our absolute favorite mods to date, including the DC Digital, the PS1 Digital, and the GBA Consolizer. With Pixel FX, they've officially joined forces to facilitate the development of new mods with more features, and the first console they've taken on together as a team is the N64. Shout out to Dan Coons for installing a couple of kits from the first N64 digital batch into our own consoles so that we could check it out as soon as possible. You might remember the RGB 200 series episode on the N64 from way back in 2015, when we had the opportunity to test out a pre-release Ultra HDMI mod. This has remained one of the most impressive and transformative console video mods we've ever used, but the extremely sporadic availability over the intervening years has frustrated an eager base of potential customers. Ultra HDMI version 2 hardware did release in limited quantities in 2020, and added the option for RGB output without needing a separate RGB mod. While we've never had a chance to test it ourselves, our understanding is that the HDMI aspect functions identically to the version 1 hardware that we already have. But for many people, the key factor will simply be availability. The Pixel FX crew has about as decent of a track record as can be expected when it comes to a small team restocking niche electronics. But don't be discouraged if the N64 Digital isn't in stock right this second. Our best recommendation is to simply watch the Pixel FX Twitter account and RetroRGB.com to keep up with the news on when restocks are expected to happen. According to the Pixel FX documentation, N64 Digital is for advanced installers only, which definitely doesn't sound like us. They do have a list of recommended installers, but keep in mind that shipping and installation service will add to the final cost. The main draw of the N64 Digital is naturally its HDMI output, which unfortunately does have to be mini size due to the space constraints within the N64 housing. We found that small HDMI sized adapters tend to be unreliable, but in our experience, adapter cables or full on mini to full size HDMI cables usually work nicely. The default installation method requires a small cut to the original plastic, but Laser Bear Industries does offer a 3D printed AV out replacement part that will let you preserve the original plastic piece. However, our understanding is that at present, you generally cannot fit both an analog cable and a mini HDMI cable into the no-cut piece simultaneously, whereas you absolutely can use both at the same time with the cut method. As the name implies, the N64 Digital provides a true digital-to-digital -digital HDMI output, with the audio and video signals being pulled from the console before they're converted to analog. However, the N64 generates a variety of noise patterns, which may give the appearance of analog noise. This is just a natural part of the console's graphics, and may be more or less visible depending on the game. The on-screen display is brought up by pressing R, L, C right, and right on the D-pad simultaneously. The available output resolutions won't surprise anyone who is familiar with classic gaming upscalers and other HDMI mods. 480p, 720p, 960p, 1080p, and 1200p, which is similar to the Ultra HDMI's offerings. The N64 Digital also offers a bonus 480p VGA variant for VGA monitors. All you need is an inexpensive, lag-free HDMI to VGA converter, and voila! 
A VGA CRT can make for an excellent PVM alternative, especially when combined with the N64 Digital's robust scan lines. Custom resolutions are semi-officially supported if you follow PixelFX's mode line guide, which makes possible stuff like 768p, 1440p, and any number of oddball resolutions. Although the team tells us they wouldn't recommend trying to push anything higher than 1920 by 1440, which overclocks the HDMI chip as it is. This is definitely for experts only, and requires a good bit of knowledge of how the hardware works to use correctly and safely. So for this video, we'll only be using the modes that are available in the resolutions menu. 1200p does seem to benefit from a cleaner upscale on our 4K TVs compared to 1080p. When it comes to upscaling these types of retro images, it hasn't always been cut and dry whether a higher resolution or lower resolution gives the preferred result. For example, Dan and Kristoff's DC Digital is still one of our favorite mods of all time and shares a lot of similarities with the N64 Digital, but it keeps things simple by line doubling the Dreamcast's 480p signal to either 960p or 1080p. For the latter, 960p is embedded within a 1080p frame, which results in a very sharp, but somewhat small picture. Meanwhile, if 960p is accepted by your display, it'll be scaled to fill much more of the screen. On the flip side, the Ultra HDMI can perform a 5x scale when using 1080p output. But if you instead opt for 1200p to take advantage of a 4K screen's extra resolution, then the 5x picture will actually be smaller. Meanwhile, the N64 Digital lets you have a picture as crisp, smooth, tall, skinny, or as wide as you'd like, no matter what output resolution you prefer to use. And the secret ingredient is the powerful polyphase scaler. Polyphase is a term that's been coming up more and more often in the retro world lately, such as with the RetroTINK 5X, which uses a polyphase scaler and polyphase scan lines, allowing it to scale to non-integer values while still maintaining perceived pixel uniformity and an overall sharp appearance. That's the advantage of a polyphase video process, free scaling without compromising image quality but it's far more complex than that, and we're not even going to pretend that we might be able to explain it beyond simply relating it to the results that we can achieve with the tools available to us here through the N64 Digital. Let's first take a look at the aspect ratio options. As of right now, there are four available aspect ratios, 5, 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, and 16, 9. Some interesting numbers there, but you shouldn't dwell on them too deeply. The key characteristic of the 4-3 mode is that 320 pixel wide games, that's most N64 games, will display with square pixels. Meanwhile, 5-4 has a slightly skinnier overall picture. Now, this might sound a little bit crazy, but at first I assumed, in spite of the label, that 5.4 would actually be closer to the sizing of a 4.3 CRT than the actual 4.3 mode since the 4.3 mode has square pixels and I thought square pixels couldn't possibly be correct. Because if you take a look at the Sega Genesis and PlayStation, both of which heavily feature 320 pixel wide games, the pixels are skinny on a CRT. But as it turns out, the N64's dot clock rate is different from Genesis and PlayStation, resulting in a pixel aspect ratio. That's the aspect ratio of an individual pixel of 120 to 119, which is pretty much as close to perfectly square as they come. Even closer to square than the NTSC pixel aspect ratio standard of 10 to 11, which game consoles in general didn't even try to match. And, you know, CRT geometry is very imprecise anyway. Some might look closer to the 5-4 setting, others the 4-3 setting. But technically, 4-3 is closer to what the N64's dot clock intends for the CRT to do. So, I must apologize to the N64 Digital's 4-3 mode. Carry on with your square pixels. I was wrong for doubting you. On the far opposite end of the aspect ratio spectrum is 16.9, which, you know, stretches the image the whole way across. This is actually perfect for the handful of N64 titles that do have proper widescreen support, such as GoldenEye and Perfect Dark. 
However, this will only work properly in the 720p and 1080p output modes since the others don't output a full 16.9 frame. Between 4.3 and 16.9 is 3.2, which might perk up the ears of GBA fans, but don't get too excited. The Pixel FX crew told us that there isn't necessarily an intended use case for it. After all, even if you were lucky enough to own an ultra-rare Wide Boy 64, the correct pixel aspect ratio to use for it would be square. So you'd just use the N64 Digital's 4.3 mode anyway, kind of similar to how we're showing it running with square pixels on the Ultra HDMI in our archive footage here. And for the record, Wide Boy 64 isn't even all that great due to ever-present dithering. Another nice feature in the scaler menu allows you to correct the height of PAL version games. Set the aspect ratio to 4.3 and PAL input height to 240 if you'd like to see games that are normally squashed in PAL mode to display with their originally intended proportions. However, some PAL conversions did have more effort put in, being properly speed corrected and sometimes even reworked to fill the screen from top to bottom with 288 lines of resolution. In those cases, you'll have to change the PAL input height to 288, or else the picture will be too skinny and you'll lose a good chunk of the visuals on the top and bottom. Either way, owners of PAL consoles and cartridges seem to be covered nicely here. With the aspect ratio locked in, you can then freely resize the image to your liking by changing the zoom value from as low as 2x to as high as 6x. The D-pad jumps the values in quarter integer increments while the C buttons let you dial things into the extreme, jumping the thousandth decimal in increments of five with each press. This is extremely useful for N64 in particular because the games use wildly varying amounts of letterboxing. So if your goal is to fill the screen from top to bottom, then you have the power to do so. By turning on the game ID function, the N64 Digital can even remember global or per game settings when using an EverDrive. And the team is optimistic that they can later make it possible to do the same when using real cartridges. But if you're just looking for a general zoom setting to use across most games, I think 4.75 works well for 1080p, while 5.25 is good for 1200p. We're able to cleanly scale the image in these non-integer increments thanks to the polyphase scaler's interpolation, but if you'd rather turn off interpolation for razor sharp edges, you certainly may do so. Due to the nature of most N64 games, you're not likely to notice scrolling shimmer due to imperfect scaling. But I would say it's still best practice to use an integer scale like 4x or 5x if you're choosing to disable interpolation. If you match the Ultra HDMI and N64 digital settings with 5x integer scaled pixels at 1200p, the two are completely indistinguishable, without so much as a difference in brightness or color. If this is how you'd like your video output set, then there is zero visual advantage to one mod over the other. But when it comes to flexibility and scaling, N64 Digital is king. Back in 2015, when we looked at a pre-release Ultra HDMI system for our N64 RGB 200 series episode, we called its revolutionary de-blur feature a miracle for the console's video quality. But it is a matter of taste and not a magic bullet for every game. De-blur has since been adopted into some RGB mods, and as you've already seen, the N64 Digital follows suit. D-Blur removes the N64's secondary blur that occurs before the final output. It has no impact on the primary anti-aliasing function. While it's not our preference, there are codes and patches for Game Sharks and Flash cartridges that disable anti-aliasing, but the main point to understand is that D-Blur is totally separate from the primary anti-aliasing. So first of all, if you decide to not use D-Blur, then you must go back into the scalar menu and turn horizontal interpolation on. Sharp does not work very well in this case, but soft and softer will do nicely. 
but otherwise the pixels will just look absolutely horrible. D-Blur is intended for use with 320 pixel wide games, which includes virtually all of the popular N64 games and I believe the vast majority of titles overall. But D-Blur doesn't necessarily look bad with games that use higher horizontal resolutions. Yes, you lose a bit of detail since the resolution is being essentially downsampled to 320, but oftentimes you'll just have to check what a game looks like with D-Blur on versus off and decide from there. In fact, there are plenty of scenarios where you might not want D-Blur even in a 320 pixel wide game. Take a look at the font used in GoldenEye's main menu, which seems to be a downscaled high res font rather than a font designed for 240p. And as such, the N64's natural blur actually goes a long way to making it more readable. And there are plenty of other scenarios where the value of D-Blur is suspect. In particular, if using the N64 digital scan lines feature, we strongly recommend going all in on the soft or softer interpolation, both horizontally and vertically, which also seems to nullify the D-Blur setting, at least in the current implementation. I just think that the soft interpolation settings are what really sell the PVM look here. The biggest advantage of polyphase scan lines is that they look evenly spaced, even at a non-integer level of zoom. And, well, frankly, these are unquestionably the best scan lines we've seen in an original hardware solution, mod or upscaler, since, funny enough, the Ultra HDMI. The Ultra HDMI delivers an extremely convincing PVM facsimile with its retro mode preset, which even gives brighter colors the appearance of slightly curved bloomed edges next to darker colors. It can even simulate the natural expansion and contraction of a CRT that occurs as the scene content shifts between dark and light. <laughs> the N64 Digital doesn't offer anything quite so gratuitous as that, but otherwise can provide extremely similar scanline results, with a good bit more control to boot. The strength value determines how opaque the black lines are, while the saturation increases brightness and saturation, which not only compensates for the darkening of the image caused by the strength of the dividing lines, but also gives it that delicious glow that really does look quite a lot like a PVM. Late in the production of this video, a firmware update added vertical scan lines, which can be combined with horizontal scan lines to create an effect that is rather a lot like a shadow mask consumer CRT. However, while horizontal scan lines can look great at any level of zoom, vertical scan lines are limited by how the N64's horizontal output must be scaled. So they are evenly spaced only at 4x and 6x. As such, I would recommend using 960p output if you'd like to use vertical scan lines, since that gives you the largest 4x picture, although 6x would also work well if you want to use custom mode lines to unlock 1440p. This is by far the closest I've ever seen upscaled original hardware approach what you can do with GPU shaders on emulators. I'm normally not all that interested in artificial scan lines, but everything here is just fantastic stuff. But you know what I don't like? 480i and N64 games. My opinion is that 480i was always a mistake when implemented into N64 games, and when given a choice, I prefer to disable any high-res modes. I just don't think it looks good with the N64 look, and often has a calamitous impact on performance. And as currently implemented, the N64 Digital's handling of 480i certainly doesn't make me think any less poorly of the N64's use of interlaced video. The good news is that resolution switching shouldn't cause you to miss any gameplay, since it does pass the Cruise and Exotica menu to gameplay test, as well as the infamous Resident Evil 2 480i nonsense that activates when using the expansion pack. Oh, and do note that D-Blur does not activate for 480i. As of the time of this video, Bob and Weave are the only deinterlacing methods on offer. Neither provides ideal visual results, but they are fast and lag free. And you know, Weave is the only deinterlacing technique available on the Ultra HDMI, so at least matters are no worse here. 
The N64 Digital's current implementation of bobbed ear lacing is unfortunately not the best I've seen. Although it does look a touch better if you crank the interpolation up to the softest setting on both axes. I know that Bob gets a bad rap, but personally I can tolerate it when done well like you can see with the N64 Digital's RGB through the RetroTINK 5X here. Although if you were using a RetroTINK 5X anyway, you may as well just use its motion adaptive Vieira lacing. The Pixel FX crew tells us that in time they fully intend to deploy motion adaptive deinterlacing with an N64 digital firmware update. But in the meantime, 480i doesn't show up all that often on N64, so it doesn't totally ruin the picnic, but it's just something to be aware of. I mean, I'm feeling pretty optimistic about things like this improving because the firmware is still changing quite often. For example, the digital audio got some noticeable improvements during the production of this video, but the team still has bigger ambitions for it, including a polyphase sampler. The current implementation has a high frequency range that, as you can see here, is more pronounced compared to analog output or the Ultra HDMI's digital audio. But the team was already aware of this when I brought it to their attention, and even as is, it's still quite serviceable to my ear, but further accuracy to the original sound signature would most definitely be appreciated. Most potential N64 digital owners are probably in it for the HDMI output, and they should be, because while the combination of HDMI and RGB in one unit is a huge perk, the N64 digital is definitely not the best value for those who are only interested in analog video. RGB mods for N64 have been around for a pretty long time, but the result isn't as transformative as the NES RGB mod or anything like that. The N64's composite and S-video have always been impressively clean, especially on a CRT, so combining that with an $80 RetroTINK 2X Mini can give you nice results over HDMI. Either way, you'd save some money and effort, and certain people might be just as happy. But if you consider RGB on the N64 to be must-have, first check if your system has a serial number beginning in NS1. These very early consoles can have RGB restored to the multi-out with an inexpensive RGB circuit, albeit without D-Blur. Voltar's kit runs just over $30, and while my console uses a different version of the mod, the results should be similar. The next step up is Tim Worthington's N64 RGB kit, which can be installed in any N64 and does offer D-Blur. Or for a bit more money, you could go for Bordy's N64 Advanced RGB kit, which along with D-Blur, even offers the ability to line double to 480p over analog output. Although we don't have all these RGB units on hand to make detailed comparisons, our experience has been that, frankly, N64 RGB quality doesn't vary much between mods. Well, aside from Diebler not being offered on basic circuits. The aforementioned mods are all less expensive than the N64 digital, so if HDMI output means nothing to your setup, then it's probably not the right choice for you. The N64 digital offers no on-screen display over analog, at least not in the current firmware anyways. So if you want to change RGB settings, you'll have to look at HDMI to navigate the menu. Although D-Blur and the low-pass filter are just about the only RGB features to mess with anyways. It would be nice to see a D-Blur hotkey combination in the future. So basically, the N64 Digital's RGB output is great, but not revolutionary. The most obvious use for the analog output would be if you wanted to play on a PVM while sending HDMI to a capture card for your stream or recording, which is exactly what I'm doing in most situations. But you know what? 
Having that pure 240p output gives you plenty of scaling flexibility that could go beyond the N64 Digital's HDMI capabilities, such as using the RetroTINK 5X to upscale 240p RGB to 1440p without needing to tinker with custom mode lines. Future upscalers are likely to push things even further, too. Remember, the N64 inherently generates digital video noise, so unless you're using really poor RGB cables, upscaled RGB with D-Blur can look nearly as clean as the N64's digital HDMI output. So if you're already set up with RGB switchers and a good upscaler, you could save a bit of money by getting an RGB mod that's much less expensive than the N64 digital. Even if you just have a basic N64 RGB mod without D-Blur, you can optimize N64 sampling with the OSSC or RetroTINK 5X to get something that looks nearly indistinguishable from a D-Blur mod. Heck, even S-Video from an unmodified console can hold its own when using optimized sampling. But let's be clear, while upscaled analog video can provide excellent results, the OSSC and RetroTINK 5X are not entirely equivalent alternatives to the N64 Digital's HDMI output, since the N64 Digital has much more customizable controls for scaling, interpolation, and scan lines. The catch being that for all its power, the N64 Digital only improves on a single console, while upscalers could be used with many consoles. So it just depends on which approach best suits your needs. Let's wrap things up by taking a quick look at some of the N64 Digital's other noteworthy features. The frame lock setting determines how the image is buffered and how much lag is introduced over HDMI output. The input lag on the minimal setting is determined by your zoom factor relative to the output resolution while the input lag on normal is determined only by the output resolution. The amount of lag can actually be viewed under system and then debug. When using 1200p set to the minimal setting, we see that a zoom of 4.75 has lag of under one millisecond, while 5.25 zoom is about 1.5 milliseconds. These numbers would be a bit different at other resolutions. On the other hand, normal mode always has about 1.1 milliseconds of lag when using the VGA resolution and about 5.3 milliseconds for 1200p regardless of any other setting. For context, one frame at 60 Hz is 16 milliseconds, so you start to get an idea of how the lag is essentially negligible. Both minimal and normal modes output every single frame the console generates at a consistent pace, but just in case your TV or capture card dislike N64 timings, triple buffer mode brings the output totally to spec, at the cost of input consistency. Triple buffer lag varies from about 0 to 16 milliseconds, and duplicates a frame a few times each minute to match the standard. Although given the typical frame rate of N64 games, this is highly unlikely to be noticeable. Our understanding is that the Ultra HDMI operates under a very similar triple buffer setup. The N64 Digital does not impact the game speed in any way, so it should be completely valid for speedrunning or tournament play. Combined with a very low lag TV or monitor, you could really optimize your target latency to be essentially indistinguishable from a CRT for high level competitive gameplay. As with the DC Digital and the PS1 Digital, a Wi-Fi chip is part of the hardware and makes updating the firmware a breeze. This previously took a bit of work, but a new interface was introduced with the N64 Digital that lets you use a mobile device to get it connected to local Wi-Fi. From there, it's smooth sailing. You can check the change log, update firmware, and even choose a firmware channel, which may be especially useful in the future as we've been told that certain planned features may not be able to all fit on the FPGA so you'll be able to pick the firmware branch that suits your needs. The N64 Digital might not do anything particularly new, but it does many things on a level much higher than what we've seen before, from its extreme sizing and interpolation controls to its beautiful scan lines. This is overall the best mod for the N64 yet, and who knows, maybe forever. It's just that for analog purists, it doesn't offer anything that you couldn't get for much cheaper with other RGB mods. But that HDMI output really is spectacular, and Pixel FX is proving itself a titan in the vintage console modding scene, which is really no surprise considering the talent involved. We can't wait to see how this technology impacts both their upcoming Pixel FX Morph scaler and whatever console mods they decide to tackle next.